Yes, I think what I call the three worlds, these are just, if you like, names. Actually, I call them world one, world two, and world three, in order not to interfere with ideas what in the depth has to be said about this. It is so. This book here belongs to world one, insofar as it is a physical object. This book happens uh, to be written by me, and I know how much thought has gone into the book. I don't want to presuppose what thought is or what we know about thought. Anyway, I don't want even to assume that thought is something real. At the moment, I don't want to make any such assumption. People talk about thought. Let us see, that is enough. Let us call thought, let us call toothache it in opposition to the tooth, toothache, the feeling that I am miserable because my tooth aches. Let us call these things, let us call, let us say, a fright. I have a fright because I just see the motor car coming towards me. Th these things we shall call world three, world two, without necessarily now asserting that these things of world two do exist. Some people actually say they don't. Some people say only books and teeth and brains and fingers exist, but feelings, even if I squeeze myself, feelings don't exist. Some people say so. Other people speak about feelings and thoughts and so on, and we have a t rather clear idea what belongs to it and what doesn't belong to it. Not very clear, but fairly clear. That is so let us call this world two. One can say world two is the world of our subjective experiences, if they exist. Some people may say such a thing doesn't exist. All right, if they exist, it's the world of our subjective experience. Now I have to this added, or if you like, invented a world three. Now, what is this world three? That's more difficult. This book contains printed pages. That is world one. But in these printed pages are certain communications, certain ideas expressed. They are, or so I hypothesize, they are understandable for me because I have written it and understandable for you because, perhaps only because you have once been my pupil. Anyway, they are understandable obviously also for some other people because the books have sold quite well in quite a number of, of languages. So this is something linguistic, but it can be translated in other languages. It is a queer sort of situation. There is books, print, language, spoken language and printed language. They have something in common, namely the ideas expressed in them. There is something which can be translated in another language. Some, the, there must be something invariant, something which doesn't vary if it is translated from one language to the other language. 
this is something strange, and this strange thing I call World 3. I call also other things World 3, but let us first really stick to language. Certain aspects of this World 3 can be described as realization of this in a physical form. When it is printed, it is perfectly clear these are physical shapes printed on a physical paper and therefore is much belonging to World 1 as the book or the table or my bones, the bones of my head. That is all World 1. Within this World 1 phenomenon, within Within the symbols, there are the symbols, the phenomena, and within this there is something which we call, call by various names. The content of the statements is one name. The ideas is another name. We can call them the propositions and mean by proposition the content and that which is remaining the same whether I put it in English or in Italian. If what I'm now saying is properly translated into Italian then it will have the same content, the same message. There is something which if it is, let us say, I have a statement, an assertion like, let us say, today is Sunday. This is false. If I translate it into Italian, it will be again false. When I say today is Wednesday, which happens to be true just now, if I translate it into Italian, it will again be true. These are truth and falsity are properties not of the symbol as such, but properties of the content of the symbol. So, there are statements or propositions which may be true or false and which can be translated and remain true or false. Now, this book is somehow coherent in a, some, some way. It contains all sorts of things, but somehow it hangs together. So one can really call literature, one can speak of the world of literature. And this, what one may call the world of literature, for example, which is outside of us, we can understand it, we can read it, then we think it and it's inside us. But when it is just printed, it's outside of us. This world I call World 3. It is a little more as because I want to say what I think of it. I think it is part of the world of the product of our mind. That is to say, of our thought or product of our world too. So we have three worlds. The world one of physical bodies, the world two of our experiences or of our thoughts, of our hopes, of our fears, the world three of the product of our thoughts, of our hopes, of our fears, in other words, the products of world two, and we can call world two the human soul or the human mind. The idea of soul has become a little bit unfashionable 
especially the English expression. And I have heard once a philosopher say, the soul or whatever has taken its place, which is of course very funny because it shows only that something of that kind is needed. So what I call world two is the world of these things which have taken the place of the soul. It isn't only that somehow world two is a product of the brain, it is also so that the brain is a product of world two. The process is usually seen, especially by scientists, that there's an evolution of the brain and from this arises then what is they call the mind or the mental processes. I don't say this is wrong, but I do say that it is very important that it goes also the other way. If I very much wish to do something, then it's I and my wish which will surmount many difficulties and will many physical difficulties in order to carry that through. For example, it is not just the brain which has produced, let us say, flying machines. Of course, certainly, there is every reason to believe that without our brains we wouldn't have been able to build flying machines. But it is we in the sense of world two. It is we who have very much wanted to fly ever since the Greeks. And it is we who have, by trial and error, come nearer and nearer and nearer to the building of flying machines without the wish and without many ideas which are world two processes, the flying machines wouldn't have been built. But, and that I want now to say, the flying machines, like this book, are not just machines and not just world one things. Of course they are world one, but they are also world three because they incorporate theories, they incorporate propositions, they incorporate hypotheses, they incorporate propositions and discussions between people and therefore they incorporate the results of mental efforts, world two mental effort, and that is what I call world three. The objective of world three is in the main the world of the objective results of human effort and of mental activity. Now, the, biologically speaking, such things as spider webs are very similar to the human world three. They are the products of spiders. The spider may go away and the web may be still here. They serve a certain biological function so they are similar, in a way, let us say, to traps, a mouse trap which we build, which is just as much a World Three element as an airplane, on a, of course, much low, lower plane. So the spider web can really be compared. It is the product of the spider's ingenuity because the spider webs are not all exactly the same. They are built according to the conditions the spider finds. So they are adjusted and a real product, one might even say of the spider's intelligence, although intelligent is one of these questions which some people may um, say only exists in men and in computers, they would say.
anyway. And then we have the human world three, specifically human world three, which is of course very much different and very much on a higher level than let us see a bird's nest or a spider web. But bird's nest may be may be of pretty pretty high level and beaver dams are really comparable to certain dams built by human beings and therefore really of a comparatively high level of beaver world three. One cannot say, I think seriously say, that in this somewhat arbitrary terminology whose arbitrariness I have tried to stress by calling them world one, world two, world three, I think one cannot really object to that. It is only a terminology helping us to formulate problems. And one of the problems is whether world one exists, world two exists, world three exists. And another problem is how these worlds may influence each other, may interact. Now, let us take the terminology for established and let us now discuss some problems in connection with this terminology. I do wish to say that philosophers have said most confusing things about all these three worlds, indirectly or directly. Some philosophers say World one doesn't exist, only world two exists. They are the so-called idealists. They say what really exists are only my experiences, especially my perceptions. That exists. Whether physical things, which I think I perceive, do exist, that is a remote process of reasoning which may be wrong. All these things have been said and I think it is rather silly because I think what we mean by real is first of all the kind of thing which we can run against with our heads. A brick wall is, so to speak, the example of reality, as I feel when I really hit the brick wall, or let us say, a lamppost with my head. So I think that there is very little argument about the, to be made about reality of world war. It is a sane hypothesis that world one will survive when I die, and also that persons will survive when I die, and so on. So the world one, I should say, I now suggest the world one is real. That's a suggestion, but anyway. Now about world two, this, I think, hasn't been questioned until our century, so far as I know. But nowadays, there are philosophers who deny that we have experience, which is a strange thing. For example, why do human beings switch on the television set? Do they do so only to make things come into their eyes and into their ears, or do they do so because they are interested, they expect, they have hopes, expectations that there will be something new to be heard or something like that? I think it is a mistaken theory. But actually, I should say, if today in a vote would be taken among philosophers, whether World 2 has an existence or whether World 2 is really nothing and everything is happening only in our brains, 
without our consciousness playing any role. I do think if a vote were taken, probably a good majority would be saying it's nothing exists but the world war. This uh, modern idea that there exist no experiences, I suppose, has its origin in this century in the doctrine of behaviorism, which was a sort of methodological view about how we should approach and study psychology. Behaviorism is an ideology within the psychology departments of the university, and in my opinion, an incredibly silly ideology. How does ever such a thing arise? It is a sheer consequence of the observationalism of which we spoke this morning. We spoke this morning of the false theory that science starts from observation or that experience starts from observation or that knowledge starts from observation. We have shown this morning that this is nonsense. But this nonsense has led to the theory of behaviorism. Because all you can observe about a person or an animal is its behavior. So we say all that can be said about human beings is their behavior and the behavior of their neurons and the behavior of other nerves and of charges running through these nerves. In other words, only physics counts and nothing else. Emotion, joy in learning, all this doesn't count. Learning consists in learning to repeat certain unique movements like pressing a lever and so on. And you are quite right, this then led to the denial of experience or anything like that. Now, I think we have to distinguish clearly between the three-world terminology and the thesis that this world too exists in the sense that it is more just than certain physical processes in our brain or in our behavior or anything like this. Now, I do believe that world too in this sense exists, and I think every sane people believes it, and it is very interesting that physicists, most physicists, believe that world too exists, and they find it very interesting because it may affect their physical theory. I think it's a, a difficulty some people have seen in these ideas. You, you've talked of the, the inhabitants of World 3 as the products of human thought, but sometimes you've talked of them as the contents of human thoughts. And for example, you, you said they're the products of our thinking, our hopes, our fears. Now, one can... No. Yes, products of our, our thinking and our hopes oh, and our... Rather fears. than the contents of our... I mean, if I hope for something, it may not even be articulated very well, but even supposing that it, it, it is, is what I'm hoping for, or the, as it were, the ex articulation of my hope itself a World 3 inhabitant as a product, or just because it's the content of this particular, shall I say, mental, psychological... Our world, too, I think, is something like part of our biology, the world, too. These are processes, like somehow comparable to brain processes. Some people say they are its only brain processes. But the world, three, I can go to my library, open something, which was written 600 years ago, six days ago. It's irrelevant for my reading how long ago it was written, how long ago these ideas were conceived. Let us say it's a poem. I may very much enjoy reading the poem. When this poem was written, has very little influence, or may have very little influence, 
May is sufficient here, the possibility. May have very little influence on the way in which I enjoy it, in which it, so to speak, comes to life, to life in the biological sense, where it really influences my life, my enjoyment. That is, I think, the situation. Almost in all these products of the human mind are emotional elements, I would say, practically in all. But are they also things in World 3, the contents of, the, of say, the emotions? Yes. This is, as I would say, a problem of choice. How we wish, what we wish to include in a certain class of entities. If we wish to include it, I would say it may lead to a little difficulty, but it's all right. But I would say what I really want to call World 3, uh, what is the heart of World 3, I think, are the objective contents which can be true or false. True or false certainly cannot be said of emotions except metaphorically. Of course one can say metaphorically, one can speak of a true emotion and a false emotion, but the terms true and false directly apply to the content of statements, I think. And this, I believe, is the very heart of World 3, because it is something invariant, invariant, temporally invariant, even though they make, it may lose its interest for us in time. In time, this book may be more interested, in time, that book may be more interesting, but the contents themselves are invariant. The content of emotion, I think, is something which is difficult to survive in time. Some great works of literature do survive, but minor works are, after a time, no longer really interpretable or understandable. Well, let's just take the case, I mean, which, of course, is also a problem of classification, whether we really allow it in World 3. Let's take the case of music. And music is clearly, uh, it's not propositional, it can't be true or false, except again in a But I'm inclined, I'm inclined to take music and art as belonging to all three, although it isn't as easily, let us say, discussable as are rational hypotheses and problems and the solution of problems as, for example, let us say, all the scientific hypotheses which are used in building an aircraft. Mm -hmm. This, I think, is really what is biologically the most important thing of World 3, because World 3, as I look at it, is an outgrowth of biology, of life. Language is a product of living, of human beings. Language is invented by human beings, and language itself is, I think, the main heart of World 3.